Good evening and welcome to our Carnegie Council virtual conversation. Thanks for joining us. Our guest is Jason Stanley. And Jason, thanks for zooming in. Uh, Jason is professor of philosophy at Yale University and author of the book, How Fascism Works, The Politics of Us Versus Them. Our topic today is the troubled present and concerning future for American democracy. We're only three months out now from the insurrection at the Capitol, and it's unclear whether that event was the end of a populist revolt or just the beginning. At the Carnegie Council, our mission is to identify and address the ethical issues of today and tomorrow. For over 100 years, we have acted as a nonpartisan, independent organization trusted to provide ideas and resources to improve public policy. Today, we can think of no more pressing issue than the erosion of democratic values and norms in the United States and around the world. And there's no better person to address this issue than Jason Stanley, whose expertise is in the philosophy of language, the uses of propaganda, and the mechanics of fascism as a social, cultural, and political force. Jason's book breaks down fascism into its working parts, piece by piece, to show why and how it may be on the rise again. One thing that's clear from the book is that fascism works when democracy isn't working. So to frame the discuss discussion, Jason, let's start with some numbers on how Americans are feeling about democracy. And here are just three quick poll numbers. In a now much cited 2016 poll, only 30% of American millennials, those under age 40, said it is essential to live in a democracy. In 2020, a Reuters poll reported that 68% of Republicans believe that the presidential election was rigged. In just weeks after the Capitol riot, an AP NORC poll found that only 16% of Americans believe that democracy is working very well. These polls suggest that most Americans see the, see the glass as at least half empty. So Jason, do you agree, half, half full or half empty? What's your assessment of what we're looking at? I think all those polls are misleading because frankly, I, uh, the first case, I assume you're referring to the Asha Monk et al. Yes. Uh, survey, which yes. is flawed because it was a one to 10 scale. And what they said is that, and, and, and a bunch of people said democracy ranked, living in democracy is only important eight or nine out of 10. And then it was, this was alarmingly reported as all these millennials said, didn't rank living in a democracy as 10 out of 10. Okay, who cares? Uh, the uh, the eight, eight or nine, I'll take it. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so I don't think that we, that we have a, uh, I, don't, I don't think we have a, a large rolling back. There's probably a partisan divide on this question. Um, I mean, we're a very young democracy. The United States is one of the younger democracies in the world. We've been a democracy since the Voting Rights Act in the 1960s. Uh, so we were a partial democracy before that. So, uh, so uh, the 16% saying that democracy, that saying that democracy uh, is working, well, count is working. Well, count me as one of the 84% who says that there are problems, <laughs> not. Yeah with electoral, you know, just look at the Georgia's Election Integrity Act, look at the many states passed, look at the fact that we have the Senate, we have structural barriers to a genuine democracy is a country with something like the Senate where, where states like Wyoming get as much representation as places uh, as, as, you know, more representation, much more representation, as, it's, as much representation as states like California, despite the huge difference in population. None of that is democratic. The electoral college is not democratic. Uh, the fact that we have massive gerrymandering, we have programs, we have, we, have, we have experts in gerrymandering who can figure out how to gerrymander so that we have states with, uh, you know, where 53% of the population votes for democratic Congress people, but the major vast majority of the representatives like North Carolina, Wisconsin, are uh, the state legislatures are dominated by 
uh, by uh, Republicans. Maryland is considering doing that in the other direction for Democrats. But so all of that, all of those things are problems with democracy that should make us think that democracy uh, right now, uh, the system we have, whatever we call it, uh, is, is not working um, in, a, uh, in a way that benefits the people. Uh, I would put that point as saying that the system we have falls well short of a democracy. So Jason, though, what is what is your sense though of threat, right? You had kind of mentioned a one to ten scale. I wasn't going to do this, but I can't resist. I mean, you know, um, you know, we just went through this this election cycle. It was very close. There are elected representatives who sought to, you know, change outcome of the election. So I, you know, I sit here tonight and I'm genuinely unsure of how threatened we should feel about the sort of the state of democracy in the United, I'm talking just in the United States right now. Well, it was already precarious. Yeah. And what we saw was we saw, what we're seeing right now is we're seeing Republicans, generally Republicans, because unfortunately the Republican party of my youth has changed. It's uh, asymmetric polarization as they say, in the, in the lingo, but the Republican Party, much of the Republican Party has become quite anti-democratic and almost, and openly so, uh, as they've moved into minority status. So, uh, so, uh, so what we've seen is we've seen uh, legislature after legislature look at the weak points at what blocked uh, Trump's capacity to steal the election and seal up those weak points. So we're seeing election administration being taken over, being made more partisan. Next time, Wayne County won't have one Republican who votes to certify Detroit's votes. Um, you know, next time there will be two people who who think that unless the Republican wins, uh, uh, unless the Republican wins, uh, there's there's it's not going to be legitimate. So, uh, so. So we uh, so we have we have a situation where uh, where uh, we have a situation where uh, where we have massive uh, we have a systematic well thought out attempt in advance of the 2022 and 2024 elections uh, to circumvent democracy where 2020 is being taken almost as a test case as like a hey. Great, we got to see where the weak points were. We got right. to see where the weak points were. Now we're going to pass laws that enable us to deal with those weak points uh, so that next time uh, we can do it right with someone more efficient perhaps than Donald Trump. So if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying this, it's not as if this sort of this moment has passed. In other words, we, this, this was the crisis moment, the, the, the institutions held, um, and you know we move forward from here. Would you see this as an ongoing threat? I see ongoing? this as a yeah. as a as many Republican leaders uh, looking at what happened in 2020 as like a cup with holes poked in it, and they're looking to seal the cup so they can steal the election for a minority party in the future with a leader who, as it were, perhaps maybe isn't as sloppy as uh, yeah. President Trump. Um, might have been viewed as being. We're seeing a number of uh, Republican leaders. They might not have the charisma that President Trump has. Uh, President Trump has genuine charisma. Uh, and, you know, uh, so we might not get that. We might not get someone who can put it all together. But we're seeing state by state a legalized attack, a, a method of making legal what was illegal in 2020. Jason, I want to take a step back um, and talk a little bit deeper about democracy itself, and then we'll get to some of these threats and the sort of the fascism question of your book. But I want to take a step back and go to that, maybe that first question in the poll about, you know, is it essential to live in a democracy? But I get a question often, particularly from students and younger people, like, why democracy? Um, for, as, as an ethical proposition or principle, you know, what, you know, 
why? I mean, you know, don't we just want government that works, right? So what, how do you respond to that question? Why democracy and why that matters? Well, democracy, uh, it, I, I guess it's the question, why freedom? Um, how do you live in a civil society and be free? Uh, if you don't want to be free, as Plato thought, Plato thought, Plato thought freedom sounds good, but most people don't want freedom. Uh, most, uh, uh, so, it, so democracy is about freedom and it's about equality. Those are its two uh, great ideals. So you have to first ask if those ideals are important to you. Uh, if freedom, freedom, political freedom, is the capacity to play a role in the laws, in determining the laws that govern you. Uh, now, a perfect democratic society is when is one where we would all redo the laws uh, and not right. oh, follow the laws of generations that pa that died before us. But uh, but uh, that's probably too difficult in a large polity. But to have a role in the the formation of the laws that govern you is political freedom. If you're not if you're not living in a society where you have a role in the laws that govern you and which you can have no effect at all, or organizations that you participate in can have no effect at all, then you're simply, it's like a monarchy. You're living under someone else's laws. And if you don't want to be free, then democracy isn't for you. And, uh, you know, it isn't, so that's, that's, that's one argument. Now, there are other arguments that democracy is more efficient. Mm -hmm. That democracy actually, those are epistemological arguments. They date all the way back to, uh, to Aristotle. But my favorite argument, epistemological argument for democracy is given by W.E.B. Du Bois in his famous paper uh, of the ruling of men. And he points out, he put, so if you don't want to live in a democracy, you might think, well, all I want is a government that cares about me. And Du Bois thinks, says, look, nobody denies that Husbands love their wives, mothers and daughters, brothers love their sisters. But look at the state of gender relations all across the world where women have not been able to participate in the formation of the laws that govern them. These laws have been devised by people who think of themselves as loving women, by men who think of themselves as loving women and caring for them. How has that worked out for women? <laughs> And so even if you don't care about freedom, if, even if you only care about being well-treated, think about the situation of people who allow themselves to be governed by those who, who, even, by those who think they're governing in their best interest. How, when does that work out? Right. To my mind, to my mind historically, and Du Bois's point is, you know, the case of gender relations shows you know, you don't want really want to live in Saudi Arabia. Uh, in well, the other ex the other example, the sort of famous example, I think, is used is um, Amartya Sen, where he talks about there's never been a famine in a democracy. Is that right? Um, yes. Right, and the, I, I think it makes the point you're trying to make. Is that correct? Which is that if everybody has a has a voice, and um, you know, um, sort of a stake, if you will. Um, it leads to um, I think you put it in the book. What is it? Um, maximum benefit through compromise, right? That, you know, it's it, it, that the system itself works out um, better. Um, yeah. Almost in a utilitarian way, right? Uh, and, and, yeah. and I don't think, in, and, and I don't think, I mean, again, a point made by someone who is no fan of democracy, Plato, but, uh, but inequality and oppression don't work out even for the oppressors. Uh, I mean, uh, a society in which you, a society in which you live uh, uh, a, so a society in which you live, uh, where you where where people are impoverished, you're walking. You know that that's not a society that that behooves people uh, to be. Uh, that doesn't make people happy. So I don't think. Uh, and also uh, oppression. Like think think of Hortense Spillers in a powerful talk I once went to pointed out about like the state of slaveocracy. Like, think of slaveocracy. Uh, think of what happened under slaveocracy. Uh, 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 
uh, think of what happened under slaveocracy, where uh, where the uh, enslaver would go and uh, and brutalize women. What about his wife? Did she, as she walked, watched her husband walk off to do that? Was she happy? So I think people are too. Are they think that in an unequal? First of all, they think in an unequal society they'll be the ones who benefit. Right. And secondly, they think that the ones who benefit have great lives. I don't think any of that is true. Um, right. And fi and finally, there's so finally there's a set of points that you've made. It's not just a famine. It's that democracies you know, don't go to war with one another. Right. So I, I can't resist asking you one philosopher's question. And so does this does this feed into the the kind of the John Rawls view that um, you know one way to to imagine, you know, a good society is to imagine that you don't know, you know, where you are in that society, that you could be well off, or you could be less well off, or you could, um, you know, have a disability, or you could be a certain religion, or a certain minority, or whatever, and that if you, if you can uh, do this thought experiment where you don't know what place you have in the society, um, and then create institutions um, to follow that that's, a, that's a, the right path. What do you think yeah. of that idea? So that's the veil of ignorance argument. I'm not necessarily a fan of that because I don't think it's easy to imagine yourself without disability, without, uh, without, without gender identity, racial identity. Uh, there, there, are, there are particular pasts that people live that uh, that uh, that are relevant for their ethical and political mm -hmm. lives. Um, so that's why I, I I began with the oppressor. Imagine yourself in a slaveocracy, <laughs> yes. even if you enslaved others. Is that right. a happy life? Is that a life? Think of family relations, as Horton Spillers urged and has urged in at least um, in, in in her work. Think of family relations uh, right. among right. the enslaver class. Um, yeah, yeah. Are, are kings and princes really as happy as, you know, people in well-functioning de democracies uh, with a social welfare state and public goods? Uh, you know, yeah, uh, you're, you're, the argument reminds me a little bit of the conversations we uh, and, and arguments we had over the use of uh, so-called enhanced interrogation or, or torture, which is, yeah, so you can have the rights of the of the victim and so on, or the prisoner and so on. But you know what? You know, there's also the 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 the, the torturer, right? Uh, exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's there's sort of two roles to play yeah. here. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So so you don't need you almost don't need this, the veil of ignorance. Massive right. inequality is a society. Well, you know, I mean, I live in a mass in massive inequality. I benefit and I I I benefit massively uh, from living in 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 you know, I, I, I'm, I teach it at Yale, you know, I've benefited, uh, I'm in the privileged oppressor class as it were, but, uh, but I think that a, a world of more general equality where, where I didn't have to worry about, uh, you know, do, do we want our kids going to schools where, you know, all the teacher, the, you know, all the school, living in, living in society that, that Dewey envisages and Du Bois as well, where, where everyone goes to roughly equal schools, they're they're together with people of different socioeconomic classes, and everyone gets the same very good education. Or do we really want this situation? We're all panicked about what schools we want to send our kids because there's such massive educational inequality. Right. Um, I think I think even the rich, privileged people I know are kind of more panicked than your basic German citizen or Canadian citizen is like, I send my kid to the cool down, school down the road. <laughs> yeah. So um, let, me, let me follow this, this line of questioning with a question about, um, which often follows the why democracy question, which goes to- Oh, so, Joel, um, Joel, let me just say, sure. so I, I gave, I, I just wanted to summarize the arguments for, yes. for why democracy. Yeah. Number one, freedom and equality. If you like those, then you need democracy. Number two, uh, even if you don't like those, there are benefit, epistemological benefits, better policy in a democracy where you can draw on everyone's knowledge uh, in, in the formation of policy. Three, uh, democracy guarantees equality and inequality uh, is gonna be bad because whether you end up as oppressor or oppressed, an unequal society is not one where you really wanna live. 
Okay, so let me push back on you. What's so great about about democracy when you look at you know what's happening to the climate, um, when you look at you know the the uh, the pandemic, when you look at you know the inequalities that you're talking about, when you look at the global financial crisis, when you look at the quality of people in public life right now. I mean, is it is it is it really is it performing right? I mean, what's what's so what's so great? You know, I've seen I've seen a war, I've seen financial crisis. Um, you know. So I would argue those are because of undemocratic features of our society. Uh, we've given our we've given our political system over to corporate control, massive financing by the finance industry. The financial the financial crisis was caused by deregulation of the finance industry, um, not placing it under the control of democratic institutions. A democracy is not simply a bunch of people; it's also democratic institutions. Democratic institutions are walled off from political uh, influence. So we need a CDC walled off from political influence. We need uh, economists, uh, the dismal science. Uh, uh, we need walled off from political influence. You know, when economists are making huge amounts of money as, uh, as consultants for finance industries, they're not walled off from political in influence. So we need democratic institutions walled off, uh, uh, universities. Uh, you know, you should be able to explore topics in universities. You should be able to debate. You should be able to critique capitalism, defend capitalism, and those should be walled off. And then you draw on the expertise that results from those institutions. Uh, and uh, th th this is this is uh, not what has been happening in the United States. And I would argue that the ills you discuss um, are due to capitalism, to capitalism bending, twisting, and controlling democracy. Climate change is, is climate change. Well, the democratic institutions knew what was happening with climate change, but the oil companies, uh, the oil companies muddied the informational waters. And so there was no clear, democracy requires a, an open public space, but that open, open public space where we can debate and figure out policy, as you know, we're all supposed to be uh, the, uh, the, we're all supposed to be uh, deciding on policy together, uh, is that uh, money, when money uh, can bend that informational space, it's not a democratic informational space anymore. Yeah. So I, I can't resist asking you, what, what is your line on the kind of much now discussed um, failure of expertise or skepticism of expertise? And we're seeing this, you know, we saw it early in the climate issue, you know, denial of climate change. Uh, we're seeing it, you know, now with the in, in the immediate sense with the vaccine issue. Um, has there been a failure of uh, of expertise? And um, how do you how do you think about that in light of the way you're thinking about democracy and its the threats to it? So there's a huge issue <laughs> which we can't resolve here in a short time about the role of expertise in a democracy. Um, so, uh, so I think of democratic institutions like scientific research institutions as, as public goods. Um, you know, I think of drawing on, on something like a CDC, the CDC as a public good. But the worry is they can be twisted and corrupted. Um, and, and you don't want them to function undemocratically. You don't want them to, uh, to intervene illegitimately uh, in the public will. So drawing that line between what's a legitimate interference uh, by democratic institutions, what we as a community would collectively agree upon to give as a role to democratic institutions is tricky. We all go to doctors. We take what doctors say seriously. Uh, and, you know, we appoint, you know, the, the idea that we, uh, we would sort of put our faith democratically in certain institutions uh, that's part of the system of a large democracy. But what's happened is that that collective trust in each other has been completely eroded uh, by, by a kind of militarized politics. And so no one trusts these organizations. Uh, no one trusts these organizations. This was the aim of, of uh, climate, uh, of, of the sort of climate war that the oil companies had. Uh, the tobacco companies did this as well. Um, the, the, the goal was to create these alternative, the oil companies created these alternative 
uh, pseudoscientific organizations that would muddy the water and create doubt. They would say, oh, well, there's no consensus. It's only 99%. And unfortunately, climate scientists did the wrong thing by not being alarmed. Um, they, and I'm the, I take that lesson in my work on fascism. I'm not gonna make the mistakes that the climate scientists made in the 80s and 90s. The mistake they made was not being alarmed. They said, we don't wanna be too alarming because what we see is so frightening that if we frighten people too much, then uh, we're not going, you know, they, they won't go, they won't think we're reasonable. Uh, but as a result, we are where we are. Uh, you know, the change from global warming to climate change was suggested by the climate change scientists themselves, but then it was adopted by the Republicans. You know, it was, it was you know, it's, uh, so, uh, so I think, you know, people criticize me for talking about fascism, saying I'm being alarmist, but I think uh, if only someone had been alarmist about climate change. Um, so, so we have these forces, these capitalist forces, uh, they're bending and twisting and creating mistrust. Uh, and so the system by which our, by which we collectively agree to have a CDC, to have, to have, uh, to have various, to have an EPA, to have various democratic institutions where we hand over policymaking to them uh, because we trust them. That system, uh, the, the, the system of capital has raised doubts, has intentionally. And so no one knows what to believe and they don't believe in those institutions anymore. So yeah, I mean, I'm going to skip right to that that element of, in the, in the book where you talk about anti-intellectualism as a, as an element of, of fascism, right? I mean, it's a it's a built-in feature. Um, what is the antidote to that? You know, you know, I you know you know I, I think of I think of democracy in as an enlightenment project, which is based on reason and compromise. So when you just, when you come face to face with that, is it, is it just that, that's it? I mean, is, is there, what is the, what is the appropriate response? Do you just say that that's it and we have to deal with it? Or uh, I don't know, you know, this is uh, sort of an occupational hazard, I guess, for those of us who are in a, um, um, you know, in a uh, educational capacity in some way. Yeah, I mean, the, the solution to the politics we face. So my book is about fascist politics and core yeah. to fascist politics is ridiculing uh, universities, NGOs, cosmopolitan intellectuals arguing in an agonized way about how to defend democracy to represent that as weakness, corruption and decadence. Uh, and to say in the face of the world's problems, we need a strong leader who instills us with pride and dominates others and we don't, you know, dominates other nations. And this whole thing of sitting around and agonizing is just so much weakness. So how do we represent there in fascist politics, you represent democracy as weakness. You represent compromise as weakness. Uh, yet, you know, anyone who has little kids, I have little kids knows that compromise is strength. You get, if I get my six year old to compromise on anything, I mean, you know, six-year-olds are little fascists. Uh, sorry. <laughs> the, uh, you know, I mean, they don't compromise. My way or the highway. So, you know, to compromise, that requires strength to, to, to say, okay, there are different fundamental views about, on value. Um, so, so I think one way we do it is the way fascist politics works is it represents, it represents uh, difference as a power grab. So the idea is, is uh, no, gay rights is not about just other people living differently than you, living as they want. It's about destroying your life. So that's what you do. You, you say feminism isn't about uh, just women having equality. It's about taking over your rights and privileges. All these things that are representing uh, 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 Black Lives Matter is about Black people taking control. It's not about uh, equality. It's not about, uh, it's not about, you know, dealing with massive racial injustice. It's about power, a power ground. So this is what you face. So you have to, and then you have honest, decent conservatives who, you know, my, my cousins are ultra Orthodox or are, are, uh, traditional Orthodox living in Midwood. I want them to live their life. They have no 
I don't think that I should intrude on the, the, their way of life. Uh, I'm not a threat to that. Um, so w- honest conservatives are brought into this kind of politics because they think, oh my God, the liberal intellectuals want to destroy our way of life. So we have to reassure people that part of the bread and butter of democracy is difference. Right. So, but there, so there is a, a real clash there, um, and you see it in the language of, um, you know, the open society, the idea of cosmopolitanism, the idea, and then that connects to economics as well, free trade, free movement, and so on. So, but that is perceived by some as a threat. Correct? Do they see it as a threat to their way of life? In so let's way? distinguish what's economic from what's cultural. Right. Um, I, I think that capitalism, there's no reason to think that capitalism and democracy are consistent. The forces of yeah. capital could, could bend and twist democracy, uh, having too many oligarchical interests. And then the idea of free trade is, you know, I mean, free trade could, could erode, could erode worker protection. So, so that to me is an economic issue, uh, but uh, that, that is sort of orthogonal to the question of democracy. Um, but an open society in terms of a, a culturally open society, that some people, that democracy allows people freely to live their lives, that it allows people to, uh, to uh, you know, I mean, I mean, we have a public education system, we have a public commons, and in that public commons, you are going to encounter people who are different than you. And that, that's part of democracy. Uh, but that difference shouldn't be threatening. And the, the a- anti-democratic forces want to represent that difference as threatening. They want to say, you know, if in public school, you, you learn about how bad slavery was, how bad convict leasing was, how, how much those repercussions uh, are present today, you know, with my children, we were counting the number of my, my, my children, are African-American, this is my wife, we we're counting the number of African-Americans that live in our neighborhood of East Rock, a very small number, you know, four, five that they've seen, you know, whereas there's a black neighborhood that's incredibly poor. You know, we live in manifest racial uh, inequality. Learning about that is part of democracy, learning about your society and the different parts of your society. Um, but you can still live, none of that should threaten you. Uh, you know, none, none of learning about reality should threaten people. Truth, uh, truth is part of being able to make informed policy decisions. But, you know, if you represent difference as threat, then uh, you can, rep- then, and you represent you know, cosmopolitan difference, sort of the desire to learn about multiple traditions as a threat, then, uh, then you can turn conservatives against democracy. Right. So do you see, um, you know, what you're describing? So this is a sort of anti-pluralism, basically. It's a rejection of pluralistic society. And so it would seem to me that this is precisely the, um, the element that connects um, you know, Turkey to Hungary to India to Brazil, um, and then in the persona of then very much so the fact that we even know these names, you know, Bolsonaro, or Erdogan, Orban, Modi, and I don't know, you could throw Trump in there, perhaps, right? These are cultural nationalists, right? Um, right. So this this is, um, I mean, um, do you see this as a as a global movement that's connected in some way? in according to this anti-plural principle or am I sort of projecting onto that? I, 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 I don't make uh, qualifications like I see this. It is a global <laughs> movement. Uh, 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 that's what it is. So, uh, you know, and they're linked. Um, I think there are clear differences because of national, national differences. Um, you don't have hysteria over immigration in Brazil. It's not part of the, this kind of cultural nationalism. Homosexuality is the enemy in Brazil. Transgender people who are increasingly become the target worldwide of the far right. Um, so uh, so uh, feminism, uh, that's the enemy. Paulo Freire, uh, Marxism, you know, mar- the leftist radicals together with the uh, sexual and gender minorities 
Brazil adds the element of social Darwinism, the mind boggling death toll of COVID and COVID-19 in Brazil laughed off by Bolsonaro with the most extreme social Darwinist comments about weakness. We are a strong young nation. Uh, with India, it's a clear cultural anti-Muslim cultural nationalism. Hindu nationalism harkens back to RSS, an actual fascist uh, organization um, to make a pure Hindu India. Um, Orban is a kind of clean, uh, sort of non -vi less violent uh, uh, than Brazil, say, um, uh, version of, of traditional European Christian cultural nationalism. Uh, so so uh, through this gender ideology, as one commentator is correctly pointing out, uh, is the sort of frame that links, that, that is used by all of these, uh, in from India to Brazil to Hungary, Orban really started. It's all the same. They're borrowing from each other's playbooks. Uh, right. Gender ideology was uh, Orban's target. Uh, he drove Central European uh, University, Hungary's best university, out of Hungary because they were le doing leftist indoctrination, gender ideology, cultural Marxism. This was taken over word for word by Oli Ola via Olavo Cavallo, one of the Bolsonaro's uh, intellectuals, uh, and uh, and and here in the United States, gender ideology, gender ideology is a target. Trans transgender, uh, our, our fellow citizens who are transgender, uh, uh, are a target. Uh, and of course, in the United States, uh, you will have added on to that uh, black liberation, you know, black equality, because in the United States. You know, it's all in the end about race. So, uh, I mean, you know, this kind of divisive politics is always going to latch on to a kind of white Christian nationalism. Um, Great. Hey, Jason, I knew this was going to happen. Um, you know, we're, we're lots of questions and a lot of back and forth. I do want to um, remind the people who are watching if they would like to uh, ask a question or make a comment to deliver it to the chat and we'll see if we can get to some in the, in the next few minutes. Um, but before we do that, I, I, I wanted to press you a little on, um, you mentioned Orban and, and to me a very interesting character in the sense of his being very deliberate and explicit about his idea of what he calls illiberal democracy. No. Um, and so he would say, I, I meet the standard of democracy. I am elected by the people, freely elected, uh, and yet he's used his power to then um, sort of um, take over the influence of what we would, I would consider uh, the basic democratic institutions, meaning the courts, the press, uh, the education system, right? These are what I would consider the pillars of a democratic society. And so how do you, how do you sort of deal with that challenge? It's a, it's a really interesting one and he's, um, and he, he sort of dodges the fascism question by saying it's not violent, right? I mean, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I have the power of the state, but he's not using it um, in terms of mobilizing the police or the army. He's doing it in a different way. That's right. So, uh, so uh, first of all, I don't think it's democratic at all because there's no free press at all in Brazil. If there's no free press, it's not democratic uh, because. Uh, you know, I mean, if you're lied to, if you're constantly shown propaganda, then it's not a democracy. You're not freely voting. You're the people of North Korea would vote for their leader in, a, in an open election, but that's because they have no free press and they've been lied to. So if you're not aware of the world, uh, you know, if you have lots of false beliefs due to propaganda, then uh, you're not freely voting. So, you know, it's not even... It's not even an illiberal democracy. It's not even an illiberal democracy because you need an informed public to be voting freely. Uh, and uh, an informed public uh, is, is something that Orban has removed from Hungary by destroying the universities, filling them with Hungarian nationalists, destroying the press. Um, uh, it's certainly not a liberal democracy for the reasons that you said. said, said. The courts are filled with or bonds loyalists, 
And, you know, when we think about violence, well, uh, you know, um, the political theorist Elizabeth Cohen has a book where she criticizes the distinction between um, economic migrants and refugees and, uh, and uh, migrants from war. And her point is that, you know, uh, if you're like squeezed economically, you know, <laughs> to the point where you can't eat or you can't, you know, you can't have gain, gain any livelihood at all, that is no life at all. Uh, it is a life. And, and so it's not as extreme in Hungary. If you're targeted by the government, you'll be bankrupted. Uh, you know, they will take your house. Uh, they will take, they will remove your capacity to have a live, livelihood. You'll be in civil court forever. Um, so it's not as bad as the conditions that Professor Cohen considers. She's considering economic migrants from countries that say have been devastated by climate change. But, you know, how, isn't that violence if you have to go to court all the time and every dime that comes into your bank account is seized by the state? That's what's happening in Hungary right now. Um, so, you know, yes, it's not violent to have your bank account removed, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's no life that you want to live at all. Uh, so that's what's happening. And, and, and you know, Hungary's uh, a tin pot dictatorship that's going to, Orban is, is going to, you know, has already been in power for a decade and is going to be in power for much, much longer unless something really unforeseen changes. So, uh, so I don't think, I wouldn't say it's a democracy because uh, people are not making an informed vote. Um, the, the propaganda that dominates the airwaves, um, you know, uh, undermines people's sense of reality. Uh, the panic about things like gender ideology, about non-existent threat of Muslim immigrants uh, 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 destroying Christianity in Hungary. So, so I think, uh, I think, you know, this, the very idea, you know, democracy is not majority vote. If democracy were majority vote, then, you know, you could say North, North Korea could have a vote and say, hey, they elected a uh, dear leader again, you know, uh, but that's because there's no free press. There's gotta be a free press. Um, there's gotta be uh, common public goods. There's gotta be a set of conditions for it even to be a democracy because uh, even a majority vote is, uh, has to be an informed majority vote. That's great. I'm going to summarize um, some of the questions that are coming in and sort of deliver them up um, in a sort of a summary way. Um, and this gets to the sort of addressing the the issues that that you just raised. Um, and I have a sense I know that the, the probably is going to the your answer is going to be both and, but I'm going to give you kind of a, a sort of a little bit of a choice here in terms of how to how to sort of respond to what to what we're experiencing and what we're seeing in places like Hungary and Brazil. And um, is, is one answer is, um, I suppose it's sort of the Jeffersonian answer or whatever, which is, you know, that, that democracy depends on an informed citizenry and it's kind of a notion of civics, if you will, which goes down to empowering you know, individuals to think for him or herself and to, you know, become political actors in this way. Um, but the other side of that is more like you, you were saying, which is no, the, that, that's obviously a part of it, but the real attention needs to be institutional, right? We have to, we have to look at the institutions that we have and either kind of fix them or bolster them or change them, you know, in some really important ways to meet the 21st century. So, you know, given those kind of challenges, like where would you put your, your energy and your, your enthusiasm now? I mean, is, is the answer gonna have to be, you know, a better educated citizenry that will respond in a certain way? Or is that kind of unrealistic and we have to think more about the institutions that we have? Well, instead of both and, I would say it's a false dichotomy that okay. you're, they're putting out. Yeah. Because one of the set, I'm teaching philosophy of education this semester as I yeah. do it every year. And one of the central institutions, I mean, in a democracy is its education system. Right. the system that gives you an informed citizenry. Uh, Danielle Allen, in her book on equality in education, argues that, that the goal of a democratic education, the goal of an education, I mean, everyone, every political philosopher who defends democracy from Rousseau on centers the education system in their discussion of democracy. Rawls kind of twists this, but Danielle Allen, argues that the goal of a democratic education should be to give 
um, people the kind of argumentative and linguistic capacity to engage in policy debates. So the, if the institutions are working correctly, then people have the, then, then what the institution, what the central democratic institution does, the schools, is it gives citizens the capacity to understand what's at stake, to have a basic grasp of history and science, to be able to evaluate the threat to the climate themselves, to be able to evaluate and to be able to discuss with fellow citizens and make points in a convincing way. So, uh, so what you pose is a false dichotomy because you know the way to destroy democracy is destroy the education system. When you destroy the education system, then you destroy citizens' capacity to engage democratically. Um, so, uh, so the first foremost, so when you have a, a country, so, so that's why we have this systematic attack on our education system. We have a systematic attack on our education, and uh, we have systematic attack on our education system. And also we have an undemocratic education system. And I feel somewhat guilty for, for making this point somewhat hypocritical because I teach at Yale, which I think is probably an undemocratic institution. You shouldn't have places like Yale in a democracy. Uh, you know, you should have just universities that cater to the public and, and, you know, in a general way and are not elitist and things like this. So, uh, so, so I think the institutions give you the citizens uh, and the citizens in turn comprise the institutions. So if you tease the institutions and the citizens apart, you're making several errors. Number one, you're, you're not seeing that you only get those citizens if the institutions if, uh, are, are working. So you only get democratic citizens from a democratic education system. Um, never forget Rousseau's the author of Emile. You know, do all these democratic theorists also included education systems that were supposed to produce democratic systems? And also, if you don't, if you tease apart the institutions and the citizens, you don't you forget that the citizens make up the institutions. <laughs> and so, if you don't have democratic citizens, then the institutions are not going to function democratically. If you have citizens who are motivated by avarice uh, and, and making a buck, then they're not gonna function democratically in the institutions. So you shouldn't set things up the way you did. Great, so um, here's another question which just kind of puts the sort of the moment that we're in in, in again, a global context. So if you think about um, threats to democracy and you talk a lot in your book about the internal threats, you know, the inequality question and so forth, but there are other threats um, which are global in scope. So, you know, the obvious one is, is, is climate, which is putting tremendous pressure on society. We have the pandemic, which is putting tremendous pressure on society, which is again, a quintessential global problem. We have, um, if you look in the virtual world, right, we're increasingly connected by information and technology, you know, and now it's gonna get speeded up by 5G and AI and so on. Um, increasing connection there. And then, um, you know, the other issue we have right now is the migration crisis. We have people moving, right? Just people moving. So, um, and so as I look at all that, the, the, the sort of, the, the sort of pressure on society is more and more collective and global. And yet the politics are actually going exactly the other way, which is, you know, basically put up walls, um, you know, uh, protection, whether it's trade or whether it's, um, you know, privacy or whatever. Anyway, you can, you can, so what, what I see, you know, our, our topic is, you know, are, you know, are, are we facing an undemocratic future? It would seem to me there's, there's tremendous pressure to at least, if not be undemocratic, to at least pull in and to become more sort of populist and protectionist and nationalist. Um, right. how, do you, how do you respond to that? So, so I don't like the word populism, so I'm not going to respond by calling ultranationalists, authoritarians, populists, but uh, I think populism is good. <laughs> I realize political right. scientists use the phrase in a way that, in a different way that makes it problematic, but, right. but there's too many good resonances. But, um, but nationalism, people are responding with nationalist responses to global problems. Um, when there are global problems, what we need to, you know, climate change is not going to be like, oh, you've got a border. I'm only going to, I'm going to stop here. That is not how climate change works. Anyone looking at the United States right now recognizes this. Farmers in Iowa, we're not going to be able to subsidize farmers in Iowa 
from, you know, for forever from the destruction of their farms, <laughs> you know, and, you know, Iowa is America last I checked. So, uh, so, uh, so, you know, I mean, we've dealt with this by giving them massive subsidies. That's not going to work forever. Uh, so, uh, so, so, how, so the, the ultra, so crises can work in two ways. Crises can, you know, the, the ultra nationalist, the fascist, uh, politician, you know, creates a sense of terror and fear um, with with crises. Uh, Hitler Hitler thought there was a going to be a global food crisis, and so he said, "Look, you know, there's going to be a global food crisis. Not every nation will survive. What we're going to do is we're going to make sure the German nation survives. So there's going to be one group. You already see it with a, with Greca, Guillaume Fay." Uh, in his 2001 book, um, Why We Fight, I believe it's called. Um, he's mm -hmm. a French fascist. Um, he, he, he identifies climate change as, the, as a crisis like Hitler identified uh, a supposed food shortage crisis. And Guillaume Fay says, well, we need to make sure the French nation survives. So, uh, so, so fascists, fascist politicians will be using the climate crisis that way. Um, uh, that's to say they will want to make it worse because it will keep them in power longer. So, you know, what you have to do is you have to look at this and say, do we really want the climate crisis to be worse? If we, uh, you know, it's what you do as uh, in fascist politics is you make reality worse to make your fear mongering because it's the politics of fear to make your fear mongering more effective. You make the immigration crisis worse so that your fear mongering uh, about immigration uh, is worse. Um, so, so uh, you know, they want things to get worse. <laughs> so we have to face that. That's the situation. Do you want the climate crisis to get worse? If you want the climate crisis to get worse, vote for nationalist, ultra-nationalist politicians. Ultra-nationalist politicians will say, don't think globally, think locally. That will make the climate crisis worse. That will increase the number of migrants seeking to flee from stricken nations. And that will keep those ultra-nationalists in power. So um, I, yeah, Jason, I have a question. I, I'm just, this is from me. Um, I'm just curious, not from the group, but um, as you were speaking, why, why, this is sort of a counterfactual, I guess, but why didn't... Um, I guess we could even just talk about President Trump as an example, use the pandemic crisis to consolidate power. Wasn't just President Trump. It yeah. was, uh, it was, so this is the other thing about crisis. So, so I'm sorry, I was, I was, I was gonna get to two, uh, two, two points and this is the other. Crises, Hannah Arendt in Origins of Totalitarianism says that reality strikes in a way that, you know, reality doesn't have a side. So it's this scary thing for authoritarians because they can't control it. Reality doesn't come with a politics. And so for an authoritarian who wants their only authority to be their own, uh, for an authoritarian, the only power and authority is their own. Reality is scary because you don't know where reality is going to go. So, so, uh, so Trump uh, did use the, uh, uh, so it, he did use, uh, the, the, the pandemic uh, 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 in a partisan way, uh, in a very clearly partisan way. Um, what he did is he spread, um, he spread doubt, climate, he spread pen, uh, uh, COVID denialism among his supporters. He tried mm -hmm. to destroy the US post office and raise skepticism about um, absentee, absentee ballots. And he tried to claim that whoever wins on election day wins the election. So he clearly did use the, you know, so he, Republicans, uh, so the goal was to have Republicans dominate voting on election day and to have absentee ballots come in and to discredit the absentee ballots as not valid. Um, but Biden won such an overwhelming national victory that Fox News announced Arizona going for Biden on election day. That meant that Trump's strategy, which he very, not only, you know, I watched, I watched, I watched his rallies, he, he, he told you this was his strategy. 
He told you repeatedly this was his strategy. So he did use it strategically. It just didn't work. Um, but that said, and here I'm going to do a little bragging uh, apologies. I, I had to get the preface of my for, uh, for my the paperback of the book in on March 14th of 2020. And they said, the press said, you have to talk about COVID because the book is coming out in May 2020 and everyone will be thinking about COVID. So I had to make a guess as to how yeah. the kind of leaders I was talking about would do. And at the time, everyone was saying what you were saying. They're going to be, they were saying, oh, Trump, Bolsonaro, Modi, they'll, Putin, they'll clean up. They'll use this as a way to seize power. I said the opposite. I said, I bet those leaders will do the worst of all. And that turned out to be correct. Um, so, uh, so, and that's because of the anti-intellectual, anti-expertise, the view that, you know, uh, and, and the, the unpredictability of reality. That's great. I, I have two more questions. Um, I'm going to kind of summarize them and then we'll... Um, uh, uh, yes, by the way, thing. Nate is right. Right. That, so Nate Lunceford yep. points out exactly correctly that Trump thought COVID, and we know this from the Jared Kushner, the, the Vanity Fair article about Jared Kushner, that, that as soon as they thought it was more a Democratic problem, more a problem for Democratic voters, they, uh, they backed off national planning. Yeah. Um, Couple, a couple more things I'd like to, 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 to try out with you before we, before we end. Um, and we, one is um, this issue of religion. Um, and, and I'm interested in a little bit too of a historical perspective about how religion and religious institutions kind of play into the, the sort of national socialist, the, the, the fascist scenario, how it's done that in the past. And then also maybe just a reflection on kind of where we are, um, we'll talk about the United States, we're kind of becoming more and more secular, but any, uh, but there's this strong evangelical. I'm just curious how religion kind of bounces with you. And then the, the, the other, I'll just put it out there now, a, a second question is, and this goes to sort of engagement um, with the public, um, how concerned are you about the, the, the part of the public that's just, um, I'm tuned out? This is just too. This is just. This is just too ugly. Um, I'd rather just put my head in the sand and, um, and you know, see you later. Um, so anyway, two 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 separate questions, but maybe somewhat related about engagement with the. Right. The public. Let's go in reverse and start with the disengagement. Yeah. Uh, I at various times, uh, the Republican strategy has been to use a kind of fascist politics to demobilize. Yeah. To get people not to show up, not to participate. So people always say it's not fascism because these tactics were used to mobilize and they were used to mobilize on January 6th and the lead up to that. And they will be used to mobilize again. But they were also used to demobilize, they were to get people to be not involved, to tune out, to say it's all a mess, let us handle it. Um, so uh, so uh, going to the religion question, this was asked by somebody, by, uh, by uh, Ronilso Silva uh, from Brazil. Uh, and no accident because um, Bolsonaro has put together a coalition based on evangelical Christian, on evangelicals in Brazil um, that is uh, cross-racial. So you can't really, he has many black evangelical supporters. It's a different, the, the Brazilian left made a big mistake by not, uh, by not having incorporating, uh, by not having a racially representative leadership. Um, so, uh, so, and so we see religion taking a major role in all of these movements. Israel, uh, 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 Israel, India, Brazil, the United States, uh, or, uh, and Hungary. Um, and the way it does is the way it did in the past. You say to, to, to people, gender ideology, homosexuality, transgender movement, feminists are a threat to you. They don't want to just, and then you add in the United States, what you say is the black people are a threat to you. Um, that's the United States edition, always. Uh, so, uh, you, and then you say, you know, uh, you might not like our methods. So they say this to ordinary, you know, uh, religion is not any threat to democracy. It's part of democracy. It's part of the tapestry of democracy. But what you say is you say, you know, you might not like our methods. We might be brutal. We might be brutish. We might be... Uh, we, we might not be 
we might not have the same traditional morals you do, but if you support us, we'll go bash the heads of those feminists, the, the, the minorities, the gender minorities, the sexual minorities, we'll bash their heads and make sure you run things. So that's the role it plays. And uh, to me, Christianity is a religion that is inimical to this. Uh, it's inimical to the bashing heads of those who disagree with you. So. Great, thank you. Um, as we wrap up, um, I just wanna like give you the last word is in terms of kind of, uh, you know, answering that, that question that we started out with about where we are um, facing undemocratic future. What do you, what are, you, what are your sort of sort of parting words for us? I mean, what should we be thinking of as we're sort of taking in uh, current events? We, we just need to, we're looking at a transformation of the things that Trump very openly tried to do into policy in many states. And we need to do, we need to put pressure on corporations uh, which are gonna go where social pressure dictates to, uh, we, we need to say this is unacceptable. We have a long history um, of racism. We, we, we really just in the 60s became something you could call a country that aims to, to, to democracy. And, uh, and we're gonna fall back on that. We're gonna fall back on the bad old days. We're watching the, something like the bad old days come back. Uh, and, uh, and if you're patriotic, uh, you won't let that happen. Right. Well, it's interesting. I closed the little piece that I wrote on this with the idea that this is in some ways um, something we have seen before. Um, yeah. We've had struggles like this before. And if there is anything exceptional about our country or about our version of democracy is that it's open and that it self-corrects. Yeah, so exactly. I think that, I think that and, that's and what we're, it's kind we're waiting of, for that. Yeah. Yeah. So and, and if we don't do it, if, if the democratic citizens don't do it, no one's going to do it for us. Right. Jason, thank you very much. It's been an amazing hour. It went really fast. I hope we can get you to come back again uh, sometime to continue this conversation. And we'll get you to the council in New York when it's uh, appropriate to do that. Um, and just as we close, I just want to tell all of our, our viewers and our listeners that um, this um, conversation will be posted on the Carnegie Council website, um, also on our YouTube channel. And we'll also have some um, brief segments as well. And uh, there'll also be a transcript and you can listen to it as a podcast. So uh, there's a lot of resources there like this. So I hope people will go and, uh, and visit those, those sites. So um, Jason, thank you again. Thank you everybody for watching and listening and uh, hope to see you all soon. Thank you, Joel.